Welcome back to Random Book Club Podcast. I'm your host, Dan Van. We're covering The Last Wish, the first book in the Witcher series, and we're covering Chapter 1, Parts 3 and 4 today. But as you can hear, we have a special guest, special guest Donovan McMullen. How you doing, bro? I'm doing great. That's awesome. Last Wish, first book, Chapter 1.3. One. Yeah, one point one one two one three one. <laughs> yeah, I know it gets confusing, but it's chapter one, part three, and part yep. four. So Ooh. chapter one point three and one point four, and this is when uh you know you told me last week that you just kind of stopped reading until we get caught up to where you were at in the book or whatever because you had read this a while ago and and basically through yeah. the summaries you're getting it and I'm I'm sure a lot of the listeners are like that too, so. Uh, this is the part when what just happened in the last part, as we remember, uh, <laughs> this is when, let's see here, going back to my old notes. I wrote a lot of notes last week. Velorad, uh, Castellan of Wisem scratches chin. Oh, this is when we met Velorad, uh, the little yeah. governor guy. And, uh, what was the word for it? What was the new word that you learned? Castellan. Castellan. And um, I'm pretty sure that word stopped being used in like 1603. So that's fine. You know, I didn't, I didn't know it either, but I assumed that that's exactly what it meant was just somebody in charge. Yeah. Like, and, cool. and we get another word like that right away, right out of the gate from the first paragraph. So let's get started. Summary. Full test was a slim and oh, because. Okay. Sorry. We got to go back. <laughs> so basically, basically. Velorad talked to Geralt about, hey, you want to do this job? Hey, do you want to kill this Striga? We'll give you money. Well, I know some guys who will give you money. You know, that kind of thing. Well, and it was, it was, you, the king's going to pay you to get rid of the curse, but, you know, no one's ever been able to get rid of the curse. So just blah, kill blah, blah. Striga. And this is what gets weird, okay? Because, like, I'm pretty sure already in the list of monsters that we got, Geralt's dealt with a Striga already at this point. He has. Yep. But then, is and that's confirmed in this to, part because right, the king and, but will everybody ask him. that okay, and I, I do remember that, but everybody assumes that curses can't be lifted, and Geralt, like the entire time, doesn't say they can. We go, we get into it in this chapter, but yeah, yeah we get into it in this chapter about what exactly so is going on. At this on. point, we're assuming that he's just killed every single Striga he's come across, he, if, and he probably has, he probably has, and he does, he actually brings that up about. Yeah, we're witchers. We kill things, kind of thing. Oh yeah, yeah. He always does. Yeah, he tends to always bring that up. So we'll we'll clear up. That's a very good question, Don, and we will get to that answer coming up. Summary: We're talking about King Foltest here. Folt. This is from the book. Foltest was slim and had a pretty, too pretty face. He was under forty. The Witcher thought. The king was sitting on a dwarf armchair carved from black wood. His legs stretched out toward the hearth where two dogs were war warming themselves. Next to him, on a chest, sat an older, powerfully built man with a beard. Behind the king stood another man, richly dressed, and with a proud look on his face, a magnate. A magnate. Ooh, yeah. What is a magnate? I mean, We've heard about it. We've heard about business magnates. Wearing, like, yeah. I feel like this is more like a dude wearing armor. Well, like, he's richly close dressed. To it. No, like no, I'm thinking. Yeah, I, I agree, but I'm wrong. I'm just saying. In my mind, he's he's the uh, battle mage sitting in the corner. He uh, the a magnate mag is defined as a wealthy and influential person. So this is these two guys, beard guy sitting on the chest, the powerful old beard guy, and this uh, richly dressed, uh, proud looking magnate. They're his like oh, what do you call it when the king has like people around him? Uh, his uh, that give him ideas and help him with stuff. Not his entourage, his... Council. Council. His... Yeah, what yeah. You... I mean, there's so many words. Yeah, well, I'm trying to think of one in particular, and I can't remember it. But we'll we'll find out what the word is before the end of the episode. But anyway, that, basically, these are the guys that are his close advisors. There it is. <laughs> That's the word. So, King Foltest cuts straight to the point. By firstly identifying Geralt as a witcher from Rivia and presuming that he also has some experience after making a joke about guessing his gray hair is that color because of magic. 
King Foltis asks the Wisher to share some of his experiences, but Geralt reminds the king that he probably knows that the Witcher's code of practice forbids them to speak of their work. The king is well aware and calls the code convenient, so that so he asks about Geralt's experience with monsters instead, specifically Spriggans, vampires, Leshies, and lastly, Strigas. The Witcher simply answers, yes, I've dealt with those. <laughs> Yeah, I I got this. We yeah, we've done that. And now now here's my question. Is this code of we don't hey, hey, well, you don't ask us like what we do. It's like what there's like three levels of this code. Is it what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas kind of code? Is I, it like a doctor's oath, you know, where it's like, hey, well, patient doctor confidentiality, like I can't I can't tell you what I've done. Well, the way it's written in the book is he's like he tells the king like uh like you know like he says you know that the witcher's code of practice forbids us to speak of our work so it's like a it's a code yeah i'm thinking the the third option which is like my favorite one is it's like the magician's code <laughs> never we reveal your party you tricks, baby. tricks done eh. you know it's more of like a like an fu kind of thing but it also makes sense so well who knows i mean if they spoke about their work that might scare off more people that might think people that they're that they're monsters or something, something stupid like that. You know, I don't know where they get their powers from. Obviously, they can't talk about that, but they can say, "Yeah, I've dealt with this creature. I've dealt with that. I can do it. Just pay me the right money." You know. I believe their powers come from the mutation, but I don't know if we've covered this. I know it. Uh, we did not on podcast, but it's be interesting to find out because that is one thing I don't know either is what type of mana system or magic system there is in the world of witcher well we will we know there's a cost to pay we, that, well, uh, will we we will explore oh, that yeah. in this chapter just a little bit we get a glimpse we girl yeah, girl gives I mean. us a little something to satiate our hunger on the magic system not in this part i think in part four um, right yeah but and I'll, we'll wait then yeah so we'll we'll bring it up uh it'll be this episode so hang tight at this, the king turns to Velorad to make sure that Geralt has been briefed on the situation. Velorad assures his gracious majesty that he told the witcher all the deets. King Foltes lays down the rules to be perfectly clear. No killing his daughter and no marriage to her if he succeeds. Geralt ag agrees and is set up in the castle with food in bed. After the king leaves the chamber, the guys get comfortable. Velorad chugs down a brew and pours himself another one. Ostrit, the magnate, sits a uh, magnate sits in the king's dwarvish chair and starts stroking the arm while scowling at Geralt. And Lord Seglin, the bearded man, sits at the table and encourages the Witcher to ask any questions while they wait for supper to be served. So, king's gone. Now we can chill a little bit. Velorad, after being like "Your Majesty, Your Gracious Majesty" and stuff, now he's he's yeah, like yeah, "Fuck yeah. that, chug, chug, chug." King. <laughs> Yeah, what's funny now is is I was at this point in the book I was assuming that this is where the money is going to be coming from. Potentially, the, the uh, side money. The it side doesn't hustle money just to ch 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 get the hell out of town, cut her up and leave. Yeah, and what happens next is basically an interrogation by Geralt because the king's like, "Well, we know that uh, witchers always have a lot of questions, so I'm going to leave," and he leaves with his two dogs. And then these guys are like, "All right." Like, Ostrit, the the magnate, the, the wealthy guy, doesn't like Geralt for some reason or something. He's just scowling at him. But Lord Seglin seems to be more helpful. And he's like, hey, man, you got questions? We're waiting for, uh, you know, leak soup. So hit me up. So here is the string of questions. Geralt gets to brass tacks and starts asking who, what, where, and when, and why. He is like a detective mode here. So G-Man. I'm going to go by order of the questions G -man. asked. G-Man. <laughs> G-Man. After the Striga's appearance, the king called up many knowing ones. Seglin, that's right, but don't say uh, Striga. Call her princess. It will help avoid any mistakes in front of the king so he won't kill you. G-Man. Ooh, Jesus. Yep. He's like, yo, man, uh, just call her princess. You know, you don't want the king to get upset. Uh, Seglin. Okay, G-Man. Uh, was there any well-known or famous knowing ones? Any famous wizards that were here? Seglin. There were several, but I don't remember their names. Do you remember any names, Lord Ostrich? 
Ostrich. I don't recall. <laughs> but many of them enjoyed the fame and recognition. Okay, they're not given names. That's fine. G-Man continues. Were they all in agreement that the spell could be lifted? Seglin. They didn't agree on much, but the prevailing thought was that the spell could be lifted, even without magic, as long as someone stayed the night next to the sarcophagus from sunset to the third crowing of the rooster in the morning. G-Man. Could you give me a description of the princess? He sa- he does this in the book where he's like, he's going to say <laughs> the striga, but he's like, uh, the princess. Well, he's so matter-of-factly that it's like... But that's the that's one of the things about... I love this G-Man that he does so well is that he uh he adapts very quickly mm-hmm. like he's always i hate to admit it but like he's the smartest one in the room but he doesn't you don't know he's the smartest one in the room until he does the thing that you're like oh oh yeah okay he knew yeah and i knew with him the whole time too yeah like that's how you want to believe that but he does know more than you the reader even and it's it, i like that about him yeah and he's a it's a really cool um like dichotomy between Geralt and someone like the king. The king is also someone who knows a lot of stuff too. Very wise. He yeah. knows he knows Geralt is a witcher. He's from Rivia and he knows of the code. Yet he still asks about uh hey, give me your experiences, bro. And then Geralt this is like confirming what he knows being like as you know, the code of the witcher, uh the the code of practices, we don't talk about it. And he's like I knew that. Also, he lets him know that he knew way. that. Yeah, what a cool way for the author even to like if if we wanted to sec this even further. Yeah. To let us, the audience, know about something about G Man, Geralt, that we didn't know prior is because it's now this this knowledge this king is like, oh, this king's like, oh, common knowledge that witchers don't share what they what they do. And then we're like, Oh, like we the reader yeah. get to find that out. Well, it might be common but, to him or people that are higher up or people right, that are in positions very, to hire it's witchers. Just, it's an interesting way. To, to as an author to instead of just saying g-man yep. never shares the shit he does yeah like <laughs> you don't have to read a book that way and it's interesting and you get the you get the um, impression from Geralt that he would share it he's not sharing it with these guys though you know like right. if he if he's yeah. talking to like a knowing one or another witcher he'd probably be like yo well, dude this is really fucked up like the knowing ones either <laughs> who knows but like. i feel like if he's talking to someone who's uh, aware of the type of magic that he deals with, then maybe he would be more open. But in this Isn't situation, he's tight-lipped. They don't remember any of the knowing one's names, but, like, they're powerful. And that to me, that's, that's awkward, but they must not have common names, right? Because we know they don't. But they all everybody's names sound different in this entire book. So yeah, it's what just was funny I mean? I don't even like, remember wizards' names. I mean, there was that Strangle one guy, uh, Marvin, the wizard of King Arthur, and there was like Marvin. Gandorf, the Ganondorf, yeah, from Lord of the Rings. Ganondorf, yep, yep, yeah. yeah. I have trouble remembering them too. So and that little boy Zelda fights Ganondorf. Yep, <laughs> the Legend of Zelda. Um, so we're going back to the questions here. Um, G Man says, "Could you give me a description of the princess?" At this point, Velorad steps in. He's he's a little drunk. She looks like a striga, and he goes like, "These she's the striga strigish thing I've ever seen, you know, or I've ever heard of." So then he explains her in more detail. Four cubits high, which four cubits equates to six feet. Four cubits high, shaped like a barrel of beer, a maw that stretches from ear to ear with fill of dagger-like teeth. Red eyes and a mop of red hair, huge wildcat claws that hang down to the ground, and she's fourteen years old. Ugh. Oh, thanks. Why? Why do you say ugh? Just because that it's... sounds so creepy. Yeah, it's scary. that sounds so creepy. If you're like, oh, by the way, it's as tall as you are, maybe yep. an inch shorter, right? So it's as tall as you are, stacked. <laughs> it has Wolverine claws down to the ground. Now, oh, oh, oh! By the way, her she jaw. Tain goes oh, ear yeah. to ear yeah you've yeah. ever seen the joker with a you know <laughs> listen like, girl have eyes. you ever seen the joker okay you know, sorry, it have you ever seen the jester too, dude <laughs> it totally reminded me of the monty python uh it's got huge teeth <laughs> yeah you know huge <laughs> pointy teeth <laughs> yeah yeah yep yeah. uh so then uh ostrid the the the, the gentleman uh chimes in Chill the fuck out, Velorad. 
His description is accurate, and she is 14. Is that of any importance? So he tells him to chill. And then is like, but yeah, he's right about the description. <laughs> uh, but why is 14 important, or is it important? G-Man, it is important. Do the attacks on people only occur during the full moon? Seglin, yes, outside of the palace. But inside the palace walls, people are always getting killed, irrespective of the moon's phases. She only ventures out during the full moon. G-Man, has, has there ever been an attack during the day? Seglin, no. G-Man, does she always devour her victims? Velorad spits on the straw. There's straw on the floor. <laughs> Come on, man, it's almost supper. She devours, takes a bite, leaves a side. It varies. Ostrid comes back in to correct Velorad. Again, Velorad, chill out. G-Man, has anyone she's attacked survived? Seglin, yes, seven years ago she attacked two soldiers and one survived. Velorad butts in. And then there was the miller she attacked near town. You remember. So we end the chapter with him going, yeah, there was two soldiers that got attacked. Only one of them survived. But then there was that miller. And then that's the end of the chapter. And the beginning of the next chapter is we start talking to the miller. But that's the end of uh, part three. 1.3. And uh, what do you think about that chapter? That that uh, introduction to... Uh, the king's. I men. liked it. It's it's you learn a lot about uh, Geralt. Um, yes, he knows what a striga looks like. Is, is at least what he's saying. Okay, so we we're still kind of building on him. We trust him. He's the main character, right? Mm -hmm. We trust him. He's awesome, but we don't know if he's a liar yet. You know, it doesn't mean that he doesn't lie. Yep, and doesn't mean that he doesn't lie to us. But at least he could be lying to the king by saying, "I, you know, I've definitely dealt with a striga." Oh, he's probably right, dealt so with hundreds of witchers. Right. That's witchers. We, we, yeah, and that's why we want to we wanna believe him, right? Our first instinct is to believe him. So when he's asking, what does it look like? At first, you're like, oh, wait, why does he want a description? And then you realize that maybe it's because if he does know what they look like, he wants to make sure they're not full of shit. Yeah. You know, so it's it's very just interesting. And I like, I like the whole way they set it up. It was very good. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I like how uh, Geralt also, like you were saying, he's very quick thinking and um, he changes, he just, he adapts to any conversation with whoever he talks with. It just seems like yeah. he doesn't give a shit. Like, uh, he just goes along with what the rules are. It's not like he's overstepping his bounds. He only, you know, but like you said, we don't know if he is a liar or anything yet because, I mean, we started this story with him killing three dudes in a tavern. <laughs> so, I mean... What did they? they what made the fun fuck of was that about? They made fun of him. Then <laughs> he just thought, "Wow." He's like that. You, he's like, "I swore that the next person who makes fun that I'm a, Riv a Rivian with an accent, I'm gonna kill." And then all three of these what guys if, show up. What if it's just Boomhauer? It's just that accent. Ooh. Wait, hold hand, man. Wait, hold hey, hand, man. Wait, wait. I doubt we're hey, just man, man. That's why. Yeah, that's why they're like, "Oh, you're a Witcher, aren't you?" You're yeah, you're one Rivia. of the Witchers. Got it. <laughs> So, uh, what if it really is unbearable? Then is it really that bad with those three guys? Did like, hey, dude, just get out of here. Nails on we a chalkboard. Yeah. Uh, so let's talk about some points of discussion here. First is the Witcher code of practice prevents them from talking about their work. It's kind of, it reminds me of like a special forces type thing. We kind of talked about this earlier. Basically, they have a code of practice, so now we know that. Um, It'd be interesting to learn more about that. Like you said, maybe there's different types and levels and stuff. Uh, the next thing, gray-haired witchers. King Foltes makes a joke when meeting Geralt that he looks much too young to have gray hair and wonders why that is. And he says, is it magic? This gives us an idea of that magic, if infused in a person, might have side effects. So that's kind of cool. If you put magic in someone, you know, they might grow long teeth or something you know there's things that happen there's there's consequences to magic in this world it's not just harry potter unlock a door it's more like it's more <laughs> harry like dude potter, unlock a door. you know what i'm saying like harry you, potter make me a sandwich wow <laughs> <laughs> got it nope. somebody's I, gotta die for that i sandwich. said no summer sausage again man why are you making that magic sandwich um does that just mean you make less sandwiches if there's <laughs> 
magic sandwiches. If you eat them, they don't have any issue in Harry Potter world. I kind of I like the Harry Potter world idea because then I could just make infinite sandwiches and not feel bad about it at all. Have so many. I would have Little Caesars pizzas, but that's besides the point. Um, next part. Plug. <laughs> yeah, shameless plug. Yeah, Little C, <laughs> if you want to sponsor the podcast, all you need to send is two pizzas to our addresses. That's it. Um, all right, the next point of discussion, great writing. You had kind of stumbled onto this a little bit in the beginning, and we're going to go into more detail about it. So the details of the dogs give us some more fantastic little details, really giving us an idea of the setting. So this is the line from the book. The king rose. This is after he's like, okay, I'm going to leave. The king rose, whistled to his dogs, and made his way to the door, scattering the uh, or, or the dogs made their way to the door, scattering the straw covering the chamber floor. So this lets me, as the reader, assume many things. First, about the king, Foltest, and his dogs. Those dogs are well-trained by sitting obediently next to Foltest during his entire conversation. Because we don't know Foltest. This is our first time meeting him. So this is our first impressions of Foltest. You know what I mean? Right. Um, but soon, as soon as he stands, they get up and race to the door, which full test allows, which shows us that he kind of cares for these dogs, uh, kind of cares for these dogs' happiness. He doesn't scold them or tell them to stay. These dogs are happier than shit just to chill with their dad. Next thing to note, the straw covering the chamber floor. This isn't an uptight kingdom. This comes off as rustic. In our world, it's fairly common for castles in the medieval times to have straw on the floor to prevent slipping when it was wet and also could be cleaned out and replaced regularly. Sometimes they would add sweet smelling herbs like lavender, chamomile and daisies to mask the bad smells of poor hygienic conditions. So it's cool that we have that these little details of all he said was the dogs ran across the floor, uh, like scattering the straw. Well, now we under, you know, you can imagine being in a room with a bunch of straw. You've been in a horse pen or something before when you're a kid you know, you've been at a farm. You know what a room full of straw smells like. So now you're, without having to say, the room smelled like straw, he's just giving you that just in the writing. Right. Or It reminded me of when I grew up on the prairie. Did you? No, I never Oh, God. I, was, but, I didn't know. But no. But uh, I, I understand. But also, I feel like that's like, maybe that's the equivalent of how they just clean things back then yeah. in the castle times. It's you know, like, it could have oh, been, there's a mess, throw some straw at it. Yeah. And, th and that's what, that's why I researched it because beer? I was like straw? straw, I'm like straw in the castle, the very same castle that Velorad said was a nice castle mm -hmm. or like a good castle. They have straw yeah, freaking on the ground. They have straw to throw down. That's why it's a nice castle. Yeah. So I looked it up and apparently it was like common in our world. Just to throw straw that's down. Carpeting. Bro, that's carpeting. Think about it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, like, okay, going deeper. No Dr. Scholes. No Dr. Scholes back then, back in the day. Going Shameless deeper. Plug. The term dirt poor refers to having a dirt ground. Most people had dirt grounds, dirt floors for their that's houses. Straw. Well, in castles, they actually had like ceramic tiles and shit and stonework. But the issue with that is all the shit got on the ground and it was like hard to clean. So they just threw straw on it to prevent you from slipping <laughs> on the shit. Because, you know, <laughs> horses be up in those castles. You know what I mean? Ride right up to the throne room. Dude, that's like the that's the equivalency of driving your Mini Cooper around in your mansion. Hey, if the gate's it's big had, enough, my man, like bring horse. her in. Yeah, it's had like riding around on a horse dude, everywhere in your castle. <laughs> that would be pretty cool. <laughs> I get a Shetland pony for in the castle and then keep the hooks clean. <laughs> A little mini, a little mm. mini. Yeah. All right, next uh, point of discussion. <laughs> First impressions of King Foltest. He seems a bit bratty. He's a little condescending and also kind of sneaks, uh, kind of sneaky with his questioning. He'll ask a question that he already knows the answers to just to see how people will respond. Then he lets them know he already knew that. Like when asking Geralt to share some of his experiences in detail, even though he knew of the Witcher's Code of Practice. Everyone is quiet when he speaks, and Velorad practically bends over backwards to make sure the king knows he's his most gracious majesty. The only saving grace for him, to me, is his dogs. So at this point, I think he's a bratty king. He's like, uh, you know, he's a pretty boy, whatever. I had, I had a poor first impression of this guy. Oh, you didn't like him? No. No, he seemed like... In the, in the, like I was talking it seemed about... like he's the type of guy that would fuck his sister. <laughs> 
<laughs> yes, actually, the very same type. Yeah. Yeah. I was just yeah, thinking yeah. that. Okay. All right. Yeah. Now we're on the same page. So. Uh, I was thinking, Great. like, okay, Geralt, we know, is the smartest guy in the room. But he doesn't let everybody know that. He doesn't parade it in right. front of everybody in right. break. This guy is also the smartest guy in the room, but he'll let you know he's also the smartest guy in the room. You know? So those were the the differences there. So I didn't I didn't have a good first uh impression. So moving on. No new places of note here. Uh people of note. We got King Full Test described as having a too pretty face, under forty, and slim. He comes off as having an obvious perception of superiority, making his opinions known aloud. He also is no nonsense and gets straight to the point in his orders. He has two dogs who love him. Lord Seglin, tasked by the king, tasked by King Foltest to stay after he leaves to give Geralt any further details he may want to know. We get introduced to Seglin in the beginning of the chapter in the king's chamber where he sits on a chest described as an older, powerfully built man with a beard. He answers the majority of Geralt's questions in regards to the Striga attacks. And then we got Ostrit. Ostrit also tasked with giving the Witcher in any info that he needs. We meet Ostrit also in the King's Chamber, where he stands behind Full Test, described as richly dressed and a proud look on his face. He doesn't answer any of Geralt's questions, but interjects, <laughs> <laughs> but interjects either to agree with a description or to correct people if they're going, uh, if they come too close to giving the King a bad image. Bestiary, we got a new beast this week, dude. Beast of the nice. week. Uh, we got something called a leshy. A leshy. Do you know what a leshy is? I do not know what a leshy is. Well, um, let's see here. I need to. I want to bring I'm up my. Learn. I'm about to learn. Uh, I want to bring up the window here. Leshy uh, sounds like a like a spirit creature. He's um. Uh, he's actually kind of a forest type creature and um, he let, I'll bring it how up many, later how many manas is he worth two so, green two black he he could be he could be so leshy four cost, four cost five five no reach <laughs> four cost five five no reach that is total magic the gathering no you want to get sued dude come on quiet dude keep that down keep that down can't say that stuff so i i can't bring up the picture of the leshy right now because because <laughs> i'm a boomer so we're just going to talk about it <laughs> not even close can't do it right now uh maybe when you're talking i'll bring him up uh, uh hold okay. on hold on ready give, give it a, a pause you got to give it a pause okay post production oh you want me to bring and, it up uh, yeah right okay Here's i'll bring the photo. it up this is awesome, dude. Okay, here we go. Right, I'm going to pull up good. an image, and we'll call it Leshy. Young Leshy. Okay, and then browse, and then go into the, the bestiary that I made. I added them to the... Um, bestiary. Add them to the collage. Bestiary. 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 Okay, I'm just going to bring up the, the PNG file. That should be fine. Bestiary. Here we go. Okay, here is yes. the Leshy. And basically what he looks like is he's kind of like a forest creature. Um, and he's kind of like a guardian of the forest. So here's the description. Leshy. Are guardians or wardens of the forests? Wikipedia has... Oh, this was cool. Wikipedia has an interesting description of a Leshy. The Leshy is a masculine and humanoid in shape is able to assume any likeness and can change in size and height. He is something or sometimes portrayed with horns and surrounded by packs of wolves or bears. In some accounts, Leshy is described as having a wife, the Kikimora of the swamp, and oh, children. Gross. So what the heck? Isn't that kind of weird? That's going to come up later in our reading. But I saw that word and I was like, holy heck, dude, that's awesome. He is known by some to have a propensity to lead travelers astray and abduct children, which would lead some to believe that he is an evil entity. He is, however, also known to have a more neutral disposition towards humans, dependent on the attitudes and behaviors of the individual person or local population towards the forest. Leshy could take... Uh, Let she could take children who were cursed by their relatives, in particular parents, away to the forest people. 
Um, some would therefore describe him as more of a temperamental being, like a fairy. So that is a leshy. What do you think about that with the Kikimora thing? Wasn't that kind of cool? Gross. Gross? Have you seen a Kikimora? No, he's not a Kikimora. He's got no, a wife. But have you, yeah, I know. And have you seen what they look like? I don't Yeah, Google maybe. that real quick. Google Kikimora. Oh, God. Have some fun. We got nothing but time. All right. We're pulling up a Kikimora now. Let's go in here. Maybe I already found one. Did I get a Kikimora? No, I didn't. I didn't get Kikimora yet. Human face. Um. Well, I'll check it out when we get to it, because now that's gonna Ew. add. That's gonna add like. Cut all this out. All this can just get snippity snipped. All right, here we go, Kikimora. Let's add. Let's consult the internet people. Kikimora. Oh God. So Kikimora is a legendary creature, female house spirit. In Legendary. Slavic mythology, her role in the house is usually juxtaposed with that of a demovoy, demovoy, domovoy, whereas one of them is considered a bad spirit and the other one a good spirit. So there's a good and bad Kikimora? Mm. Hmm. Well, they, they look creepy as all heck, and apparently some of them live in swamps, and apparently some of them marry the Leshy. I just thought it was interesting because it's, you know, all these monsters that we're seeing that we've never heard of before are from, like, Slavic legends. And I grew up knowing nothing of these. So it's really <laughs> no. it's really cool no, to see. A, yeah, it's really cool to see a different part of the world's, like, monsters and, and lore and stuff. And that brings us to Chapter 1, Part 4, <laughs> which, uh, as you remember from the, the ending of the last chapter, we were left with. Oh, there was that other guy who survived, the Miller. Remember, right? Ooh. Summary. The following day, late in the evening, the Miller was brought to the small chamber above the guardhouse allocated to the Witcher. He was led in by a soldier in a hooded coat. The conversation didn't give Geralt any more information than the scars on the Miller did. The Miller was a terrified, stuttering mess. The Witcher finished his examination and nodded at the Miller, and the soldier to dismiss them. The soldier walked the soldier walked to the miller or walked the miller to the door, then pushed him out, closed the door behind him, and lowered his hood. It was King Foltest himself. The soldier Ooh. the hooded soldier was King Foltest himself. The king tells Geralt to sit, that this meeting is unofficial. Foltest begins to have a blunt conversation with the Witcher about the task at hand. He asks when Geralt will begin. In four days is the full moon, so he'll wait until after that for when he plans to do the job. The king guesses that he will wait until after so that he can get a good look at her. Geralt says there is no need to see, just that the princess will be less active. The king cuts the crap about the princess and says just to call it a striga until the spell is broken. So it's like, oh, okay. <laughs> so we can just call it yeah. a striga now? Yeah. Okay. All right, I guess. All right. Then Fultis asks if the spell can really be broken by staying the night. The Witcher is honest and says that, yes, traditionally, the spell is broken that way, but it's not that simple. First, you have to survive the night, and then there are exceptions like not staying one night, but three consecutive nights. And then there are also cases that are hopeless. The king kind of sees this as a bullshit answer and warns Geralt that if he heard such a hopeless scenario, uh, or that he has heard of such hopeless scenarios where they just kill the Striga, and that there are some who will pay to do just that without attempting to break the spell. That he Then he tells him that if that happens, then the official order is that the Witcher would be beheaded. Geralt asks if that is an unconditional order, and the two stare at each other for a long moment before Foltus, Foltus cracks and says he just doesn't know, but he should keep it in mind. So basically he's saying, I am aware that people would pay someone to kill this Striga without even trying. He's a smart guy. He's a smart guy. Yeah. And so he's like, so just keep in mind that the official order is that we would behead the person who did that. And then... Um, Geralt said, and then uh, he says to Geralt, just keep that in mind. 
And then Geralt thinks for a moment before telling the king that he will do everything within his power. But if it comes to his life or the Strigas, then he will do what he has to. And the king should keep that in mind, too. So he kind of puts it right back in his court, you know? Yeah. Keep that in mind, too, bro. If it, if it comes to it, I'm going to freaking save myself. Foltis stands up and gets real with Geralt. Of course he knows Geralt will kill her if it comes down to it. He wouldn't punish anyone for killing the Striga in self-defense. He also says that many people have tried to do it, setting fires, shooting arrows, digging pits, all until he started hanging the attackers. He just wants an attempt to save her life. Then he tells the Witcher that whether or not he kills her isn't even the point. Geralt says he's listening. After the third crowing of the cock, there will be no more Strigger, <laughs> if I understand correctly. What will there be? If all goes well, a 14-year-old girl. With red eyes, crocodile's teeth, a normal 14-year-old girl. Except that, well, physically. I see. And mentally? Every day, a bucket of blood for breakfast? A little girl's thigh? No. Mentally, there's no telling. On the level, I think of a three- or four-year-old child. She'll require loving care for a, a long while. That's obvious. Witcher, I'm listening. Can it happen to her again later on? Geralt was silent. So he's like, it could happen uh, again, my man. It totally could happen uh, again. So I, I really like that where he's, Foltest is like, all right, man, it's not the point whether or not you're going to kill her. It's just that I want to know that you even tried. And he's like, okay, so if this uh, does go well, what's going to happen? And then Geralt's like, yeah, you, you just have a girl. She's just a 14-year-old girl. And he's like, well, what's the matter with her? Well, he, And then Geralt's like, well, she's normal physically, but mentally, you know, she's been a freaking no. striga for 14 years or whatever, you know? So Foltest is now beginning to understand the challenges that will come if he succeeds in getting his daughter back. So he asks what he can do if that happens, if it happens again. Geralt tells the king that if she were to die after a long sickness that her body should be burned immediately because probably right. the spell is still on her or something. He also tells the king that he doesn't think it would come to that, and he will leave some instructions on how best to care for her before he leaves. But Foltest says that he wants some info now, so Geralt tells him. Here's Geralt's prescription for a princess who used to be a Striga. <laughs> Dr. 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 G. The princess should always wear a sapphire around her neck, or, or better yet, an inclusion. An inclusion which is a, uh, a gem with a pocket of air trapped inside of it. And they should wear it day and night on a silver chain. Aside from that, every now and then, burn juniper, broom, and aspen in the fireplace of her chamber. Foltis became pensive, pensively thankful, telling Geralt that there will be no hard feelings if he has to kill the Striga. He continues by saying that he will shout at him and publicly banish him from the palace in town, but nothing more. So he's just basically saying, I'll give a show, but, you know, I know what's going on, you know? And I think that's really cool. So he won't, yeah. he won't give him the reward, but he knows he could probably receive some payment from you-know-who. So he knows exactly uh -huh. what the fucking thing yep. is. They, they both were quiet for a while. Then Foltest called Geralt by his name for the first time and asked what the truth was in the rumor that this happened because he laid with his sister. Geralt oh. said that the spells, the spells, that spells have to be cast. They don't cast themselves. That if, that it wasn't the act that caused this, but that he did it, but the fact that he did it made someone want to cast the spell. Right. So Foltis kind of figured that. Then he asked Geralt, where does magic and spells come from? And here is the response from the book. So Ooh. this is where we're starting to learn about the magic system of the oh, Witcher. Uh, here we go. So he goes, I don't know, your majesty, knowing one study the causes of such phenomena. For us Witchers, the knowledge that concentrated will can cause such a phenomena is enough. That in the knowledge to fight them. And kill them? Usually. Besides, that is what we're usually paid for. Only a few demand the reversal of spells, your majesty. As a rule, people simply want to defend themselves from danger. If the monster has men on his conscience, then, 
revenge can also come into play. So basically what he's saying is, yo, man, I'm a witcher, dog. I kill things. I know how it works just to use it to kill things. If you want to actually know where magic and spells come from, you're going to have to consult a knowing one because that's what they study. And then what I like at the end is he says, you know, normally we don't do reversals of spells. It's very rare that someone demands that. But as a rule, people just want to defend themselves. That's why we kill them. But then he he says, if the monster has men on his conscience, then revenge can also come into play. So he's saying, like, people typically want to defend themselves. But if that monster has killed a bunch of dudes, there's probably a set of dudes that want to kill that monster. Probably. So the king got up, went over to the witcher's sword hanging on the wall, and asked if he killed the monsters with this. The witcher tells him, no, that is for men. The king says that that is what he has heard. So he knew that answer already. He's just like getting to know the Witcher, but whatever. Or, you know, and, and what's funny is I didn't question it either. When I read it, I was like, oh, so the king is smart. He's just testing him constantly, right? Which is, that makes more sense. But also, like, he, what if that king's like, oh, yeah, yeah, I knew that. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know, I know, I know, I know. I know. Yeah. Oh, I know, I know, I know. I know, I know. Oh, yeah, I know. Yeah, he, he might be that guy. <laughs> oh, I know. So he he says that, yeah, that's what he's heard. Then he proclaims that he will join the Witcher in the crypt, to which the Wilter gives him a hard, hell no. Nah. <laughs> There's too much danger. It's almost certain death for the king and for him. He needs all his concentration for the task. Hard no. Foltis turns away and heads for the door, and Geralt th- uh, thought he would leave without a gesture of goodbye, but at the last moment, the king turned to him to say one last thing before the chapter ended. So this is from the book. I make money. <laughs> oh, what? No, okay. no. that's not what I remember. He says, right. you inspire trust, he said. Although I know what a rogue you are, I was told what happened at the tavern. I'm sure you could have killed those thugs solely for, uh, I'm sure you killed those thug- thugs solely for word to spread, to shock people, to shock me. It's obvious that you could have dealt with them without killing. I'm afraid I'll never know whether you're going to save my daughter or to kill her. But I agree to it. I have to agree. Do you know why? Geralt did not reply. Because I think, said the king, I think that she is suffering. Am I not right? The witcher fixed his penetrating eyes on the king. He did not confirm it, didn't nod, didn't make the slightest gesture. But Foltest knew. He knew the answer. He's like, ooh, that's a great ending to the chapter because he's like, yeah, yeah. dude, I know that my daughter's freaking suffering, dude. I mean, yeah, I banged my sister. Yeah, the kid's probably messed up. But she's probably suffering, dude, isn't she? And This, this dude's a real Jamie Lannister. Just yeah, around. for sure. And uh, Witcher knows, but Witcher code, my man, we don't talk about it. Witcher code, bro. Witcher code. Sorry, code of practice, my man. You saw, You saw my emblem. Every one of his gray strands of hair is from a secret that he kept. So that does it for chapter one, part four. Uh, bringing up points of discussion. Does anything come to mind for you? What did you think about the chapter? I like the whole book. It, it's it's hard for me to break it down because at this point I finished it and I'm rereading sections and it's it's everything i like about it just everything yeah and so it's hard i'm excited to get to the next part i really am because this this whole chapter was just anticipation yeah we don't know what's gonna happen this yeah. is the, the tarantino talk during all of this and you're just like okay it's building anticipation you're like all right get in there what is he gonna do and that's the thing is he never tells you spoiler alert for the next chapter you don't know what this is how it goes the entire time he just gathers information and then he's like all right let's do it and you're like all right what are you gonna do and he's like i'm not telling you you're the reader yeah and i like i like figure how it he, out as i do it i like how he gathers the information i mean he's asking questions that to him are probably fairly basic but he knows he's got to ask these questions because he wants to know exactly what he's going up against this it brings uh-huh. me back to the idea of him being like a technician even though everyone's saying it's a striga and all these knowing ones came he did. He wasn't there, so he hasn't seen yeah. it. He doesn't know what it is. Describe that's the true. the princess to me, and then they describe a striga, and he's like, "Yeah, that's a striga." But if they had described a freaking spriggan, now we got something else on our hands. You know what I mean? Uh, so let's bring up some Kikimura. points of discussion. The Kikimora. Kikimora. 
So I have turned on my opinion on King Full Test in this chapter. When we are yeah. introduced to him, he seems like a standard royalty type, able to boss people around and has small a small entourage with him. But after we get uh, the reveal that the hooded soldier who brought the miller to Geralt's room was actually the king, now we got a much more interesting character. Just with the fact that he was concealing his identity throughout the interview, he may not have even ended up revealing himself if Geralt hadn't conducted himself in a trustworthy manner. Then we have the candid conversation with the Witcher, where he ends up using Geralt's name in the end. Really, it seemed more like a guy confiding than a king demanding answers to questions. Because of this, it leads me to a small conspiracy about the king's entourage, which we'll get to in a bit. So I liked the king now, because now it tells me about the king. Hey, he's sneaky, but he does it because he has to. And my point about... Um, him, <laughs> him being in his hood. I wonder how he learned to be sneaky. Yeah, I don't know. What do you Maybe mean? Maybe from having sex with his sister. Yeah, you got to get good at that stuff. Real quiet pitter patter <laughs> across the chambers to get to your sister's room. Um, <laughs> but yeah, he, like he he kept his hood up through the whole interview with that Miller. And I imagine if the if Geralt was saying stuff like, yo, no, you know what, dude, I'm just going to kill the thing. I just want to know how to kill it. I'm going to get paid by some other people. Then the king would have just kept the hood up and been like, we're killing this witcher tonight. You know what I mean? Yeah. But instead, the witcher conducted himself like normal. He doesn't give a shit. He's just trying to figure out exactly what he's up against. Of course, this Miller doesn't give him any information besides the scars on his face. So he's like, okay, you can go. And that's when the king's like, you know what? Off the record, I'm going to have a conversation with you, bro. So, people of note, uh, the Miller survived a Strigger attack, left with scars, still terrified to this day about the attack, has difficulty describing the situation in any detail, probably has post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, <laughs> yeah, I would imagine. The thing has little ring claws yeah. down to the goddamn ground. Yeah, he was a blubbering mess. He's still a Miller. He what still makes it, barrels or whatever Millers do. What did it look like? It looked like my face got fucked up. See these these face <laughs> see these claws, Marks? It looks like that, but that's just his claws. Or her claws. <laughs> if I could see. Alright, the next person that came up. A uh, soldier that survived the first attack of the Striga. Not much is known besides that he was one of two soldiers that were attacked, and only he survived. They don't try to find him to interrogate, but I have an idea of who it might be. Are you ready for tinfoil hat time, Don? We haven't really Ooh. gone deep a whole lot yet in this book, okay, okay. but I tend to do this. All of a sudden, my mind starts going in directions that are like not ever going to be in the book. This is never going to be canon. It's just something that I think of. Who is the second soldier? Well, let's get to it. Tinfoil hat time. Lord Seglin, the bearded man, is the soldier that survived seven years ago. When we first meet Seglin, so go with me on this. It's, uh, it's okay. quite a trip. When we first meet Seglin, he is part of King Foltest's closest advisors. Not just anyone can be in with the king. Sure, we have uh, Ostrit, who is probably just a businessman who helps the king deal with the merchant folk and trading activity between towns. But what we do know, but what do we know about Seglin? He is described as an older, powerfully built, and bearded man who sits on chests. In the beginning, that's how he, he sits on a chest. He's sitting on the chest next to the king, you know? If you go along with me and agree that we can assume that Ostrit is probably the king's treasurer with a high degree of confidence, then we can also assume that Seglin holds a role with similar standing in relation to running the kingdom. In this case, he's probably the lord of defense for the king. The fact that he is sitting on a chest, almost defending the chest from Ostrit's grubby little fingers. But let's get into some of the more concrete examples of how we could determine Lord Seglin's true identity as the soldier who survived. We can guess this from his description of being an old, powerfully built man, suggesting that he might be ex-military from his age and body type. Him being in the military would explain him as being a soldier. And the fact that he is an old man, he is probably a seasoned vet and not just some greenhorn, which then allows us to understand how he could survive a Striga attack. He knew how to defend himself. He may not have won or even injured the Striga, but he survived. Speaking of survival, what does that mean? If you were hypothetically to survive a brutal Striga attack, how would that affect your life? Well, let's look at the only other person mentioned to have survived that very thing, the Miller. 
When Geralt confronts the man about his ordeal, he, is, he melts into a blubbering, stuttering mess, who is still terrified about the events to this day. To a hardened soldier, surviving traumatic, traumatic events is just part of the job. It's not great. Uh, it's not that great. Or it's not great. There can be uh, lasting effects. But you still see more soldiers that survive trying to help other soldiers deal with trauma by lending support any way they can like answering questions about the traumatic events themselves. Someone survi some surviving soldiers don't like talking about the specifics of their own experiences, but will instead offer any help they can by answering questions, almost like answering questions that the Witcher might have about a certain Striga. Remember, the only person to answer questions to Geralt was our boy Seglin. If you can prove to me that this dude enjoys wearing tennis shoes over boots, then I think you got a case. Going back to the Miller, he also said that he has that his scars give more detail to Geralt than the Miller could have described on his own. Yeah. So if yeah. the Miller has scars from the event, then Seglin should have scars too. But going back two chapters, there is no mention of scars. So I guess we can just drop it, right? Wrong. He has a beard to hide the scars. <laughs> Lord Seglin was a veteran soldier on duty the night of the Strigger attack seven years ago. He heroically defended himself and his brother-in-arms from this until the until then unknown threat. Uh, it was then an unknown threat. When uh, then he was recognized mm, by King Foltest. He was then recognized by King Foltest as an asset to the kingdom and becomes a trusted advisor of defense to the king in the coming years as Foltest ramps up his search for the cure for his daughter, which leads him to that room on that day with the Witcher. Is that too deep for Damn. you? Is that Damn, too that deep for be, you? That's, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to find out. How do you I'm find, gonna find out? out now. I'm going to Google it. Okay, you Google. Well, I mean, that's just part of the, the tinfoil hat, man. I mean, is there actually an answer to this? Tin for a hat party. Yeah, we who knows? Who well, knows? what do you There's what do you think? I mean, it is a lot of speculation, but we know that Ostrich is a businessman because they call him a magnate, and he probably runs all the trade and shit. Well, what does this other guy do? What does Lord Seglin do? Well, he's big and strong. He's got a beard and he's old. So, what if he was the surviving soldier that we don't ever meet? You know? Yeah. You think that's yeah, possible? Yeah, yeah. I do. Yeah, plausible. Definitely Objects plausible. of note. I give it a three out of five. All right, That's all a right. Plausible scale. Objects of note: sapphire gem, preferably an inclusion on a silver chain to be worn day and night to help warding off bad spells. Flora and fauna: we got juniper, broom, and aspen. If burned in a chamber, it can also help warding off lingering effects of bad spells. Magic and spells. We learn a little bit about the difference between magic itself and spells. The knowing ones of the world spend their lives studying magic. And witchers just learn how to make it work and use it to kill their targets. Spells, on the other hand, use magical forces, but it's a concentrated magic that must be cast. It doesn't cast itself, like in the case of the Striga and the Princess. Uh, the Striga Princess itself. We also learn that there are magical wards that you, can, that you can do at home, like burning of certain types of plants or wearing certain types of gemstones. So I like that because it's like, even though we're in a world that has magic, not everybody's going to have it. So what do those people do? So many times in fantasy stories, you just got wizards, you got people that can cast <laughs> spells, and there's not shit you can do about it. But, and they get lightsabers. It's like, what the yep. shit? You can cast spells and you get a lightsaber? Yep. Fuck this. Yeah, I'm just, out. I'm just a human, dog. Well, now, just as a human, go collect some firewood. Go get some plants, start burning <laughs> that shit, and the stink keeps it away, keeps the force away, you know? So I, I like that. It adds a little bit more, like, humanism to it, where it's like, yeah, we live in a world where shit is unfair, but we have ways, little home remedies that you can do that can help. And the fact that Geralt is saying these are the remedies you should do after the fact is like, yeah, there's some credence to this. There, there are natural things in the world that are a natural counteractive to some of these magical spells and stuff. And I think that's pretty cool. And that's going to do it uh, for this week's episode. Don, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. Of course. Is there anything that you want to plug before we go? Uh, again, just if you want to check out my brother's music, for those of you that have, we uh, thank you. Those of you that have not, maybe you want to check that out. Check it's it out. It's great stuff. The rest of us. 
anyway, uh, that would be probably about it. Cool. All right. Well, thank you guys for listening to another episode of Random Book Club Podcast. Check you next time. And a dab. And a dab. I finished it. <laughs> Infidabs. Infinite dabs. That's a good one. Sweet. All right, guys. Before we finish this episode, uh, I noticed that we had a bunch of comments on YouTube and other places, so I wanted to bring them up just so that you guys can hear it on the podcast of uh, people that are writing in, and we can interact with that. So uh, first comment we got from YouTube uh, was from a friend of the show wh- who um, was with us back in these sort of bedweird days, Jamie B., Mrs. B., uh, Go Wolves, 10th grade honors, honors English teacher. She writes... Uh, This is about episode one that we did, chapter one, part one, when we first get introduced to uh, The Witcher. It's a good thing that the, this is what she says, it's a good thing that the narrator can share the Rivian's thoughts because he has such a poker face around the other characters so far. It's nice to see the impressions, or the impression others have of the Rivian too, though. E.g., example, after all, who likes Rivians, which is what the narrator said. (laughs) So the narrator isn't completely objective. Also, I didn't realize the book was translated. Uh, I find translations so interesting. There are lots of types of translations out there. Literal, faithful, free, adaptation, etc. I think it works best when the translator is artistic with their word choice and has a poetic understanding of both languages so that they are not trying to force a direct translation just because it worked in the source language. I agree with that the translator does a great job of keeping the meaning and feeling faithful in this. P.S. Thanks for the video game context and the map. It's so detailed that it's hard to find things on there, so it's nice to have uh, having you find stuff for me. Thanks for the episode. Thanks, Jamie. Great to hear from you. So, yeah, I like the, I like the, um, the narrator's point of view where we can uh, see what other people's thoughts are and stuff. Next comment. You, another YouTube comment from a uh, Yeshua Rodriguez. He says, and this is also on our first uh, episode, uh, chapter one, part one. Enjoyed the dive in the beginning. I think the sign that was used was Axie. Axie is basically a Jedi mind trick, which explains why the guards agreed to take him to the governor. Uh, so, is that true, Don? Like, was that Axie? Is that what that is? I assume so. Yeah. Okay. Like that sounds about right. Because like he. Yeah, he basically, like, I don't know what he... I thought it was just because he was so uber-powered showing off magic that they're like, okay, yeah, we'll take you. You know, just like when you were giving the example of, like... Uh, you that was a, he doesn't have a magic trick that makes his armor shiny. <laughs> He's like, yeah. they're like, oh, shit, all right, let's go. Well, like, no, that have... makes, makes more sense, yeah, that makes more sense. That it is an mind. actual sign. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah we... I think of it more, instead of, like, a Jedi mind trick, I think of it more as, like, how apparently Dracula has that, like, gift of people mm. are like, oh, who's this? Like, a commanding presence. Yeah. Or he can hypnotize, right? That's his thing. Dracula can hypnotize. That's more, I think, what he gets to do. Yeah, he's, like, alluring. There's some sort of alluring yeah. magic going on. Uh, and so then I said, thanks, Yeshua. Have you read the book? I hope they discuss more signs, which we talked about. Uh, And he responded to that. Random Book Club podcast. I first played The Witcher 3, and I liked it so much that I jumped into the book series. While the games... Yeah, so you played them too, right? This is amazing. It's an amazing game. I picked up Wild Hunt. I picked up Wild Hunt. Yeah, because it was on sale for like, I don't know, $17 or something for everything. So after I'm done with this book, I'm going to play it. But I have it. It's downloaded. Ready to get on the lap. You're going to get lost in tall grass. Like, you're you're just going to be picking up stuff for like couple hours and be like it's an amazing game not do any of the quest yep anyway yeah while the games are non-canon sequel sequel to the series uh hold on i gotta read that again while the games are a non-canon sequel series to the books i do feel that cd project red the game developer did a good job in portraying the characters in the world more so than the netflix show so far i'd say oh sick burn yeshua I'm hoping he's finished it at this point because I really did enjoy it. I know you haven't seen it and you're waiting as well. Mm -hmm. Um, I was a little upset again, Henry Cavill. I'll get into it. I was a little upset. Like we were talking about this earlier. You can't have somebody as iconic as Superman play the Witcher. I'd rather have it be somebody that we don't know. So we can attribute that to him. But uh, yeah, man, couple 10 minutes in and I was like, all right, I'm down. He's doing a great job. It's, it's a good show. 
yeah, I'm looking forward to checking it out too. It looks really cool. Um, I'm also not a hardcore nerd, so like, I'm not gonna sit here and pick apart people's armors and be like, it didn't yeah. look like uh, that. Excuse book. me, the axe didn't exactly show as it does in the the novels. Um, <laughs> His they, armor said didn't Vig- glow. they said Vegima, not Vegim or Vichima. Uh Yeah, and he also said that. Also, if it helps, the game pronounces the city of Visma Vizima. So I don't know. I'm gonna keep saying it ten different ways. You'll get what I'm saying. Um, also other signs will be used sporadically along the book series. I just don't know how frequently. Ha ha. Okay. Then on our second episode, chapter one, part two, when we get into the thick of it, the really long boy chapter, uh, Yeshua commented again. He said, all the witchers are given medallions once they've completed the trials, uh, to become one. Having a medallion proves you're a witcher. So we had kind of discussed like, why does he have that? Why does that matter? So I hope that we do get into a little bit more deep on, how he actually was raised. Um, I don't know if you just know that from playing the games or not, but. So I don't know if we got into this part yet. And I, cause it's so, I don't know, like it, it does. They definitely put a couple sentences into it. And I definitely remember what part it does happen for sure. But I think it happens a few times. His medallion always vibrates, right? Mm. We always, we always, I don't know again, how far we haven't seen it in the book yet. Part. Well, okay, I mean, maybe okay. it has been, and we just haven't been um, so pointed at it. So basically, it's kind of like it's kind of like uh, spider sense almost is what I is how I interpret it. But it's not like it's it's almost like he's connected to. So when it vibrates, he already knows it's vibrating with him, essentially going. Yeah, I already know there's danger. Yeah, I can hear my. It's not like oh shit, my <laughs> the wolf yeah. guy's vibrating. That must mean there's bad guys. Like no, he already knows. So, but it is. I want to know if the medallion is more than just like a hunk of metal or yeah. like a special metal. Like, is it something that is connected to them somehow? And cause I feel like it is yeah. It's more than just a, I'm a witcher. Here's my medallion. So like, it's like it's a distinction, vibrating. like, like a distinction between an amulet. If someone were to have an amulet of power or something like that, that Again. vibrates when orcs are nearby or something versus, you know, this amulet that was made specifically for, Geralt that has maybe like his blood in it or something and it's infused yeah. with magic so it connects with his essence or some shit somebody knows right down in the comments somebody knows we'll figure it out uh, he says besides the distinct eyes of the witcher OFC ha 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 uh, we haven't seen that yet but in the next few chapters when we get into the fight with the striga we will see some glowing eyes my man uh, and then Jamie B writes in again that creature collage is so cool thank you Jamie can you share it why yes Yes, we can. If you guys head over, shameless plug here, to the uh, Random Book Club podcast subreddit, you'll find uh, the latest post is the Last Wish Bestiary Collage from Chapter 1. And if you click on that, you can click on the image, and it'll bring up that beautiful collage at all its glory. You can zoom in super far and see see everything on that werewolf and Spriggan. And Striga, which we will see in the next episode. Uh, the other thing is we had a comment in Reddit, because I've been posting on Reddit, uh, on the subreddit Wides, Widesman, which is like a, a subreddit dedicated to The Witcher. In-depth talks about it, of course, that matches with us. So um, I posted our our little uh, first chapter one, part one, and someone said, uh, Titan is back, posted saying, I heard your friend say that he has a hard time visualizing things from the book. So does a lot of people. I'd re- recommend you show him images made from the Russian translation of the books. Here are all of them from the book you're reading right now in order. So spoilers, obviously. So he sent us a link to this uh, Imgur site that has images. So let's look at the first one. You got it pulled up, Don? Yep. Looking at okay. it right now. And so I have this... to say, I'm actually happy he did this because these are like awesome drawings. Yeah, this is the scene in the beginning when um, Velorad the Castellan uh, takes Geralt to go visit King um, King yep. uh, Felstet, Feltest. And um, so now you got, you got uh, old homie sitting on the chest. You got Ostrit in the background being a grimy. Oh, no, this is Ostrit here uh, being a grimy little money merchant guy. And then you got King Feltest sitting with his two dogs. The dogs are in it. And so there's a bunch of drawings from this particular story spoilers spoilers um and i'm just gonna leave it at that so if you guys want to check that out that i thought that was pretty cool too 
So if you guys want to also comment, please feel free to comment on our YouTube or go to the subreddit, RBC Podcast uh, subreddit. Send us an email. Uh, if you go to our uh, YouTube channel, you can see there's a couple links in the in the top here. The first one is send a voice message. If, if you click on that and you connect it to your phone or, you know, your computer, if you have a mic on your camera or whatever, you can actually send us a voice message and we'll just play it during an episode. And if you have questions or whatever. Um, so yeah, come check us out and, uh, yeah, comment. We'll, we'll comment back. All right. See you guys later. Adios.